the worst and most dangerous con man is he who can convince others that he possesses the innate ability to govern, that he possesses abilities which are beyond those of the normal person, when in fact he really doesn't. He might have charisma, but that's about it. There's no substance there, it's all style. The ultimate exemplar of this kind of personality defect is the Emperor Philippicus from 711 to 713. He spent almost 20 years putting himself out there as an imperial candidate. He finally reached the throne, and then he really didn't accomplish anything. So today we're going to talk about this con man extraordinaire. Although he adopted the regnal name Philippicus, he was born as Bardanes, and he was a child of privilege. His father was a patrician named Nicephorus. Most likely, his, either his father or grandfather had been an Armenian refugee, as his family was a relocated Armenian family, which, like many others, grew up in Western Asia Minor. Um, Bardanis grew up in a colony at Pergamum, which means that he would have lived either in the southern portions of Opsicon or the northern portions of Thracion. I'm not really sure exactly what side of the border Pergamum would have fallen on during this period. Bardanis first appears in the pages of history in 695 when he participated in the overthrow of Justinian II. At this time, he began to drop hints that he was interested in holding the throne in his own name. The reason why he wasn't all that successful during the 690s is most likely because his primary base of support was from the Monothelite party. Now, the Monothelites were a group who were heavily composed of people whose origins were Syrian, and it, this is also a group which had been condemned as heretical in 681, so this is a group which is out of power and probably not numerically dominant in any way. So this is why Bardani's early attempts at putting himself out there as a candidate weren't all that successful. I think it's safe to say that anyone with imperial ambitions whose primary support base is an out-of-power Christological faction probably doesn't really have the best political instincts. Well, Bardanis provides further evidence of his lack of political awareness when, during the reign of Tiberius III, who had just overthrown Leontius, he had a dream where he was overshadowed by an eagle, and stupidly, he told this dream in public to try to make everyone aware of the fact that he was destined for imperial power. Well, Tiberius III heard about this dream, as you naturally would if a prominent nobleman and the son of a patrician went about the streets telling everyone about it, and he decided that Bardanis was a potential threat, so he exiled him to Kefalonia. When Bardanis was initially exiled, he was sent to the island of Kefalonia, which is a place that is very nice. It's a sunny island right off the coast of Turkey, so although Bardanis wouldn't be happy being in exile, no ambitious politician would, he was at least in a nice place with beaches and sunshine. But when Justinian II returned from exile in 705 and reclaimed power, he decided that Bardanis should be sent somewhere that sucks. So he reassigned him to Cherson in the Crimea, the same place that he had been for 10 years. Now, it was from Cherson that Justinian II had launched his bid to reclaim the throne. And he should have really thought this through a bit more, but he hated Bardanis and he wanted him to go to a place which he thought was kind of a shithole. So he sent him to Cherson. Well, how would that go? So after five or six years in Cherson, Bardanis decides that the time has come for him to mount a campaign for the throne. So he takes up the imperial name Philippicus and he allies himself with the Khazars who are a local power in what is now southern Russia. And he also creates a revolt among the Byzantine subjects in the Crimea. Well, Justinian II recognizes the danger immediately. He himself had married a Khazar princess and used the help of the Khazars to reclaim the throne. So he sends a punitive expedition. And all this really does is antagonize the locals and put them more in Philippicus's camp. However, we can't really say with a lot of precision exactly what happened next because the sources are pretty bad for this particular um, chain of events. All we know is that the expedition that 
Justinian II sent was either defeated or it simply defected and joined Philippicus. We next know that while Justinian II was in the field anticipating an attack from another quarter, Philippicus and his men were able to seize Constantinople. They presumably were let into the city. And Justinian II, despite his best efforts, was not able to rally a support to launch a counterattack. And as his army melted away, he ended up being assassinated in 711, thus leaving Philippicus in charge of the Byzantine Empire at long last. If my math is correct, then 16 years elapsed between Philippicus's participation in the first overthrow of Justinian in 695 and his rise to power in 711. And yet, he seems to have learned absolutely nothing about politics in that period. So, normally when you come to power, you want to make moves that are popular and which secure your power base. That includes installing some loyalists. But to install those loyalists, you need a pretext of legitimacy. And that's something that Philippicus apparently couldn't understand. So, he immediately removes the Orthodox Patriarch Cyrus and installs John VI, who was a Monothelite loyalist. So in the long run, not a bad idea. However, you need to go through the proper channels. You can't just go out and do that when the Monothelites are still technically branded as heretics. But Philippicus, not the brightest when it comes to politics. And rather than calling a church council of his loyalists to change the church's doctrine and put him in the right, he simply decided to renounce the findings of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Well, the Pope obviously is not happy about that, because if you know anything about the medieval popes, they're always trying to assert their authority over the patriarchs of Constantinople and the Byzantine emperors. And if you have an emperor acting tyrannically and doing things over the head of his own church, then the Pope will then see that as an opportunity to gain some cookie points with the Christian community as a whole, and... And you know, predictably, the Pope just said that uh, Philippicus was in the wrong and refused to recognize him as emperor, which further undermined his legitimacy. So, Philippicus, in his early moves, all he did was make himself unpopular and alienate most of the religious community around him. Nearly all usurpations come with unintended consequences and challenges that the usurpers did not anticipate. And for Philippicus, that challenge took the form of Turbul the Bulgar. So, back in 708, when Justinian II was in the middle of his second reign, he had lost a massive battle against Turbul, and then the two had made peace. And that peace still stood in 711, so Turbul had actually sent an army to help um, Justinian fight Philippicus. Well, because um, you know Philippicus had seized power and defeated Turbul's ally, Justinian, this gave Turbul a reason to renew their war. So Turbul decided to invade, and he and his Bulgars pushed all the way up to the walls of Constantinople in 712, plundering as they went. And for obvious reasons, this weakened Philippicus's hold on power and made him look weak in the eyes of his new subjects. The situation in Europe was beginning to look grim, so Philippicus summoned the thematic army of Obsequion to the Balkans in order to repel the Bulgars. The problem with this move is that it opened up the Byzantine heartland of Anatolia to more Arab raids, since there were fewer troops to maintain the frontiers. And this area, the Anatolian heartland, was more or less the Byzantine heartland at this period. This is the area where Byzantium is producing the majority of its wealth and recruiting a large percentage of its troops. So allowing the civilians in this area to suffer and overstretching and overworking the troops there was not something which would endear Philippicus with this pivotal area. And in addition, the Opsikian army would not be happy about being moved from its homeland. So uh, Philippicus has created a one problem trying to solve another, and he has yet to be able to get ahead. Arguably the biggest challenge that any new emperor faces is establishing his legitimacy and getting the various armies of his empire to recognize that legitimacy. Well, Philippicus had not been on the throne very long. He'd only come to power in 711, and now we're in early 713, so less than two years, 
which really isn't enough time. And when you consider all of the bad things that had happened, including the ones that Philippicus had inflicted upon himself, you can see why he really didn't have any respect whatsoever from the army. So the Opsikian thematic army was unhappy being assigned near the capital. They wanted to go home, and they decided that the problem was not so much the Bulgars as that they had an incompetent and ineffective ruler, so they revolted in Thrace. Officers from the Opsikian theme were able to confront the emperor in the capital, and this would ultimately lead to the end of Philippicus's reign. By 713, Philippicus's legitimacy had slipped to such a point that not even his bodyguards bothered to defend him. So when the officers of the Opsikian thematic army seized him in the Hippodrome, they were able to blind him without encountering any known resistance. So why then was Philippicus blinded? Well, here is one of the great ironies of Byzantine history. So Philippicus's great political rival, as we've already talked about, was Justinian II. And Justinian II had been deposed and mutilated in 695. And up to that point, a mutilation of the nose was considered um, enough to keep someone from exercising imperial authority because it was kind of a symbolic uh, mutilation which made someone too imperfect to exercise political power. Well, Justinian II decided that this tradition was stupid and he came back and ruled for six years despite it. So if you really want to keep someone out of power for the rest of their life, the best way to do that is to make sure that they don't have the physical ability to rule. So what the conspirators from the Opsikian army did is they had Philippicus blinded. And apparently this procedure was pretty brutal because he seems to have died that same year, possibly from complications or possibly from depression. It's hard to really say. And interestingly enough, Whereas thematic armies tend to elevate their own generals to the purple after seizing power, in this case, the officers decided to choose Philippicus's own chief secretary, Artemius, and put him on the throne as Anastasius II, someone who is um, named after the famous emperor from the 5th and 6th centuries. And so died Philippicus. He won't be missed. But he's gone, and we can move on and talk about other people who are way more interesting. So, it's a time for celebration. <laughs>